Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1050, College Algebra for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I will be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. So in this video, lecture 45, we are sort of starting the beginning of the end. We're going to be in our last chapter entitled Chapter 7, Pre-Calculus, um, for which this Chapter 7 has essentially three goals for our lecture series on College Algebra. And let me kind of illustrate to those to you really quickly before we get into some examples. So our first goal of this pre-calculus chapter uh, is really to review uh, topics we had seen throughout this entire lecture series. In chapter one, when we introduced functions, we didn't know a lot about specific function families, but we saw general ideas of domain, range, solving equations, solving inequalities. And then throughout the series, chapter two, chapter three, et cetera, et cetera, we started focusing on specific function families like linear functions, quadratic functions, polynomial functions, exponential functions, again, just to name a few. Uh, and so part of this chapter, as we kind of end our lecture series, is to review uh, these important function topics, again, domain, systems of equations, uh, inverses, graphing, difference quotients, all those sort of important function topics. But now we want to revisit it when now that we have a better understanding of these function families. And that also kind of leads us to the second topic, which actually was an idea I got from a colleague uh, some time ago, is that many students who take a class like college algebra, they're taking it as a prerequisite to calculus, which they'll be taking in a future semester or something like that. And so college algebra is good at teaching you how to work with certain function families in isolation. So it's like, oh, this is a polynomial problem. This is a rational problem. This is a radical problem. This is a logarithm problem. And we're, do, we're really good with those in isolation. But in calculus, all of these different tribes of functions co-mingle with each other, right? You can have an equation which involves simultaneously trigonometric functions and exponential functions. You could have an equation that involves radical functions and logarithms simultaneously. Now, in this, in this, in this uh, algebra series, we're not going to deal with any trigonometric functions. We'll leave that for a, 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 the series Math 1060. But the idea of sort of bringing together these different functions and working with them simultaneously is a pretty important skill for calculus, which the usual way that college algebra is taught is pretty, pretty insufficient in that regard. So as we review topics from the, pre the previous topics of the series, we're going to do that with the lens that we're going to put together things that weren't previously connected. So for example, this uh, this lecture, 45, is going to be about the topic of nonlinear systems. So we've talked about linear systems previously. So we've used techniques like substitution and elimination to solve uh, systems of linear equations as well as some matrix me methods as well. But we've also dealt with nonlinear equations throughout this lecture series, quadratic equations, polynomial equations, exponential equations. What happens when you put the two ideas together? What if we want to solve a system of nonlinear equations? We have to combine the techniques of substitution and elimination we learned previously with some of these other techniques we've learned about these nonlinear equations. So we're going to marry together different topics we learn in isolation together. Uh, because that's how it's done in calculus. That's how it's done in real life. And hence, this chapter is called Pre-Calculus. The third uh, reason why we have this chapter is because, well, honestly, there are some annoying uh, section headings I have that I just need to continue continue the jokes we, we previously had, right? Uh, it turns out that Harry Potter and Star Wars kept on making movies after the original lectures were made, and therefore we have to continue the puns. I mean, what does dancing robots have to do with systems of equations well if you understand what's you know if you understand the system is down they're taking over if you get that reference then this one fits in there as well but i don't want to spoil it for anyone all right so let's get to the heart of this first video for section 7.1 we want to study linear systems and i claim that the methods of substitution and elimination we learned previously are applicable even in a non-linear setting um, and so matrix methods like gaussian elimination would apply as well uh, you know, to, to a limited degree, I'm not saying substitution elimination solves every system of linear equations, nonlinear equations, excuse me, they, they do solve every linear system. But we can apply those techniques to help us out in even in a nonlinear setting. So let's try this first, this first video, we're going to use the technique of substitution and adapt it to systems of nonlinear equations. So consider the following two by two system, that is two equations, two unknowns. So the first equation that you see here on the screen is the equation x squared plus y squared equals 
100, which we've seen previously in this series. This represents a circle. It's a circle of radius 10, right? 100, of course, is 10 squared. And so we're thinking of x squared plus y squared equals r squared. This is a circle centered at the origin uh, whose radius would then be r. There would be 10. Uh, the, more, the more general circle equation, we get r minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. So we're using that right here. And so we can think of the first graph is the graph of a circle. All right, that is a nonlinear graph. The graph of that is not a line. Uh, on the other hand, we could take the equation 3x minus y equals 10. Uh, this is, of course, just a line in the usual sense. Um, we could put it in slope-intercept form, for example. If you add y to both sides and you subtract 10 from both sides, you would see that y equals 3x minus 10 as the slope-intercept form of this equation. Before we try to solve this nonlinear system algebraically, let's consider for a moment, what is the nature of the solution set? Like, what are the possible solutions you could get by solving this system? Well, like I said, the first equation gives us a circle. The second equation gives us a line. What are the possible intersections of an equation with a line? Well, as you see on the screen right here, uh, you can see a circle and a line. The circle is centered at the origin. The line, I'm just drawing a line. I'm not claiming that this is the graph of our circle or our line. You know, they're, they're just, a, just a picture right here. Uh, but what are the possible solutions? So in one situation, you see the following. You see the circle with a line. And this is an example in geometry, what we call a secant line. It's possible that the circle and the line could intersect each other at two distinct locations uh, because the line passes through like that. Another possibility is you could get something called a tangent line. That is, there could be a line that comes and just intersects the circle at just a unique location like you see on the screen right now. So we could maybe just have one solution to this system of equation. There's a possibility of that. Or it could be that the circle and the line are completely parallel with each other. That is, they have no intersection whatsoever. In this situation, you would have no solution, right? This would be an example of the system of equation being inconsistent. And so those really are the three possibilities. We either have a parallel line, a tangent line, or a secant line, uh, which that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call this last case a uh, parallel line. That is, it's, it's parallel to the circle. They don't intersect each other whatsoever. Uh, in this situation, of course, I'm using as my definition of parallel, nothing to do with slopes being the same, just that they're not intersecting curves. All right. So those are our three possibilities. So algebraically, how are you going to find this? Because uh, geometrically, we try to we could try to graph it like we see here on the screen. Which again, this is not the this is not the correct graph. This is just an illustration of what could happen. Um, let's try to solve this algebraically. Well, in the process of writing the 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 line in slope intercept form, you'll notice that I actually kind of solve for y. Y equals two x minus ten. And so if we try to solve this via substitution, like we said we would before, we could substitute in the, instead of the value y, we could take the expression 3x minus 10. What if we were to plug that into the other equation? If we did that, we'd end up with x squared plus, instead of y, we're going to have 3x minus 10 squared equals 100. This is now... If you look at the x, because y is now gone, this is now a quadratic equation in terms of x. Let's FOIL out that 3x minus 10. You're going to get x squared plus. Um, when you FOIL that out, you're going to get 3x times 3x, which is a 9x squared. You're going to get, when you do the when you do the next one, 3x times negative 10. That's going to give you a negative 30x. But then when you FOIL, you're going to get two of those, so it'll double to give a negative 60x. And then you're going to get negative 10 times negative 10, which is a positive 10 equals 100. So we FOIL that out. We have these terms now. Let's combine like terms. You can subtract 100 from both sides of the equation. Those will just cancel out. Um, and then we have these x squared terms, which, which combine together to give us a 10x squared minus 60x equals 0. So after we did the substitution, we, we acquire this quadratic equation. How do we try to solve a quadratic equation? We try to do it by factoring. The right-hand side is already equal to 0. So on the left-hand side, we can factor out a 10x, the common divisor there. That leaves behind x minus 6 equals 0. And so by the zero product property, we get that either 10x equals 0, which would imply x equals 0, or we get that x minus 6 equals 0, which implies x equals 6. 
So how can there be two solutions here? Well, this comes back to the picture we had earlier. What we have in play here is a secant line, right? We see that there are two possible X coordinates that are acceptable in this picture, all right? Uh, and so we have, so okay, we're gonna have two solutions. We have the secant, but what are the Y coordinates? Well, with the Y coordinates, we're gonna have to come back to the equation we had before, right? So we know Y equals, 3x minus 10. So let's insert those values of x that we found. So one of the values of x, remember, was x equals 0. If we plug that in here, we're going to get that y equals 3 times 0 minus 10. That is y equals negative 10. This gives us a solution. The first solution we find here is that when x is 0, y equals negative 10. So that's our first solution. Uh, the next solution would come about by plugging in into this equation, x equals six. So when x equals six, we see that y is gonna equal three times six minus 10. That is 18 minus 10, we get an eight. And so the second point would be six comma, six comma eight. And so we can check that both of these points are solutions to this system of equations. If you try zero and 10 right, in the first equation, we get 0 squared plus 10 squared, which is 0 plus 100, which is 100. That works out. In the second equation, we get 0 minus a negative 10, which is positive 10. So that works. So the first one passes the test. For the second one, 6 and 8, if you put into the first equation, you'll get 6 squared plus 8 squared, which is 36 plus 64, which is 100. That passes. And then for the second one, we just kind of saw this one as well. 3 times 6 is 18 minus 8 will give you 10. So these are both real McCoy solutions to the same systems of equations. And those are the only ones we were able to do. We were able to solve this system using substitution. Let's look at another example here. Uh, so let's consider the picture. Uh, well, let's sorry, let's consider the equations. You have x minus y squared equals zero, and you get y minus x squared equals zero as well. So when you look at these two graphs, they both look like parabolas, right? Uh, so the first one, you have an x minus y squared equals zero. You have the second one, you have a y minus x squared equals zero. These are two parabolas. Now, when you look at these parabolas, the first one, y equals x squared. If you were to solve for x, uh, you would see that x equals y squared. Notice that the y is actually the thing that's squared. This suggests that this is going to be a parabola that's going to be concave to the right. Uh, concave to the right here as opposed to the other parabola, which if we take that one and solve for y, we're gonna get y equals x squared. This is our standard parabola we're used to. This is a concave upward parabola. And so I'm actually gonna uh, give you the picture of these things right here. So you have y equals x squared and, y equal, and x equals y squared right there. We have these two parabolas. What are the possible ways they can intersect each other? Well, you see the picture right here. Let's just leave y equals x squared where it is. Um, you could have y equals x squared excuse me, x equals y squared, you can get something like this. The two pictures could intersect each other at two locations. Um, is it possible that they can intersect each other at maybe like one location? It could be, maybe, just, you know, just kind of thinking it, could be like that the, the parabolas are somehow tangent to each other, right? Maybe they just touch each other at one point. That's a lot easier to see when if it were like concave downward. They Maybe they only share the vertex or something. So that could be a possibility. If there was some rotation to the parabola, you could get there that were tangent like so. So one, one point of intersection is possible. This one shows us two. We also could get four points of intersection. So we could have something like the following. Uh, we have a parabola, maybe does something like this. So maybe there's like four points of intersection, right? Could you do three points of intersection? Yeah, you could have it so like the vertex touches one side and then breaks away like this. So we get three points, something like that's a possibility. Um, another possibility is they could just be parallel to each other, right? The, the other parabola could just not intersect it whatsoever. And so when you talk about like the number of solutions here, the number of solutions, well, we could get zero, we could get one, we could get two, we could get three, we could get four. Could you get more than four? Could you get five solutions? Now that one gets a little bit trickier. If you try to start, if you try graphing these parabolas, try try it as you, Mike, you're not going to find five solutions here. Then there's actually a nice algebraic argument that's going to happen with this. We can see this from substitution, in fact. So if you take these two equations, again, solve for the linear factor. Notice you have an x and a y. Solve for the x, solve for the y. You get something like this, 
okay? Let's substitute one into the other. For example, what if we were to substitute, say, x, you know, if we were to substitute x from this equation down into this one right here. So x is equal to y squared. This would tell us that y equals, well, instead of x, we're now going to get a y squared. But then you're squaring that thing, so our equation becomes y equals y to the fourth. This is now a polynomial equation. A polynomial equation for which uh, it's degree four, right? So at most, you're going to have at most four solutions to this thing. All right? And as we try to solve it, what I would do is I would set one side equal to zero. So we're going to get y to the fourth minus y equals zero. Factor the left-hand side. The left-hand side, you can take out a factor of y, getting you y cubed minus one. And then factoring that, we will take the difference of cubes, factorization, y minus, y minus, you get y times y minus one, and then you get y squared plus y uh, plus one, like so, equals zero. For which this quadratic right here is irreducible. The discriminant you can check for that thing is going to be negative three. Um, so it has no real solutions, which means in terms of intersections, there's not going to be any intersect there's no you can't have an imaginary intersection it's got to be a real number in that case so we can throw out y squared plus uh, y squared plus y plus one right here and so from the first factor uh, we're going to get that y equals zero from the second factor we're going to get that y equals one like so and so there's two possible solutions here and so this gets back to this idea of the number of solutions when you take a parabola and insert it into another parabola worst case scenario you're going to get a degree four polynomial equation which is a which has the most four solutions. And so, although any number less than four is, is possible, you can't get more than four solutions here. Now let's come back up to our original equations, right? When x equals, excuse me, we've now discovered that y equals either zero or one. What's the corresponding x coordinate of these things? Well, you can plug it into these equations, right? Notice if you plug in y right here, you're gonna see that when, when y equals zero, x is gonna equal zero squared, which is also zero. Um, which gave us our first point of intersection right here, zero and zero. And then if you plug in one into this one, you're going to get one squared, which is going to be one. And so our second point of intersection is going to be one, one right here.